For right now, there's nothing showing in this essay. On the right hand side are our turn it in controls. The blue ones are for giving feedback and the red ones relate to the similarity report. If I click on the red controls, the similarity report will appear. Now at the top, we can see that there are no flags that have been raised in this submission, no hidden text or replaced characters. It's less common now, but at one point it was fashionable to try and circumvent systems like Turnitin by placing invisible text between words instead of spaces. So instead of a space between two words, add a few letters and change the color to white. And this way the letters don't show up and it confuses Turnitin because Turnitin doesn't see where one word ends and another starts. Instead of a, a string of copied words, Turnitin sees one very long, incomprehensible, but clearly original word. Now again, this is less common now because the kind of people who might use such mechanisms are also the kind of people who know full well that Turnitin can now spot them. Beneath the flags, we have the similarity percentage. And this is 19%. 19% of this assignment, which has been highlighted. And in this window, we can see where these matches have been identified. Here, for example, we can see that 12% of this essay has been matched with an internet source called meskpress.org. Now, I don't know what this is, but if I click on the link here, it will take me to the matched passage. Here it is. And helpfully, it's popped up a small window showing the context of the original content. This link here will open up the original source. And this is the point at which I discover that the source is actually an open source journal called Modern Education and Computer Science. My next highest match is this 3%. Again, if I click on the source, it will take me to the passages which have been highlighted. Now, if the last match was a big chunk of text, this match is comprised of a number of smaller matches, but together they add up to something significant. I can click on any of the highlighted passages to bring up the match window. I'll open up the source. And here it is. So we found two sources that have evident matches. These matches are not in quotation marks, neither are there any citations to say where they've come from. If I scroll to the bottom of the essay, I can see that there's no bibliography either. So it would be fairly reasonable to suggest here that other people's work has been used without any attempt to give them proper credit. But what about these smaller sources? This source, for example, is less than 1%. If I click on it, I can see that the match relates to this small chunk of text here. There are actually two sources listed here, telling us that this same passage of text exists in multiple locations. Now, to be honest, this match doesn't appear to be very significant. After all, most of this text is comprised of text from a random text generator. And it just goes to show that even something utterly random will inevitably have a match somewhere in the infinite realms of the internet. Now, because this match is not significant, and I don't really want it included in the similarity score, at the bottom of the window here, I'm going to click on the Exclude Sources button. Here, I can select these harmless matches and exclude them from the overall score. These excluded sources aren't deleted entirely. This no entry icon here will list all of the sources that you've excluded and should you want to, enables you to restore them. Well, that was easy. What about these other 1% matches? These look like random matches as well, so surely I can just exclude. Ah, look at them all. Oh man, do I have to go through? What? Click all of them? Ah, well, sadly, yes. Oh, it would be handy, wouldn't it, if there was a select all option, but there isn't. However, there is an option a bit further down here that might be able to help. Now, this funnel-like icon represents filters that can be applied to narrow down the matches to what you want to see. Currently, there are no filters applied but I can see here that one of the options is to exclude sources according to how big they are. Now, as we've seen, all of these 1% matches are actually harmless, random matches to very small groups of words that 
hardly constitute an academic offence. So in my filter, I can set it so that any matches less than 2% are excluded. Apply the change. And now we can see that the similarity score has dropped to 15%. And that 15% includes only those sources that pose a genuine problem. Now this essay has a similarity score of 46%, so surely we can expect some problems here. And straight away I can see something important happening. And it's not the similarity score, but it's right down at the bottom of the assignment here. In this information bar, I can see that the word count for this essay is 482. It's a great deal smaller than the last essay we looked at. Now this means that even a small match is likely to show as a high percentage. So let's look at the matches and see what we have. It looks as though all of the matches come from the bibliography. Now, this doesn't make it academic misconduct. Indeed, it would be worse if the references were not included. But because the essay is so short, the bibliography is creating a disproportionately high similarity match. Well, again, we can fix this surely by going back to our filters. One of the options here is to exclude bibliography. If I select this and apply the changes, immediately all the matches disappear. And by the similarity score alone, this looked to be the most problematic essay here. However, it's not taken us long to realise that there isn't really a problem at all. With this essay, however, we can see the opposite issue. There is only a 7% similarity map which suggests that there isn't really much of a problem at all. However, the information bar tells us that the word count is nearly 14,000 words. If we click on the match overview, there are lots of similarities around 1% or less. Most of them seem to be the same kind of random text generator matches that we've seen before. However, this 2% is from Taylor & Francis, a well-known academic publisher. If I click on this link, I can see that there is a substantial chunk of text here that does not appear to have quotation marks or a citation to show where it's come from. Clicking on the source, we can see that it is indeed an academic paper. And at the end of the essay, there's no bibliography to show the source. Although the similarity percentage is significantly smaller than the last essay we looked at, the amount of problems here is actually much greater. Now this essay has a similarity score of 31%. And we can see that this score is comprised of lots of different matches, ranging from 7% to less than 1%. Remembering the lesson learned from our second and third essays, we can begin by checking the word count. The word count is around 1500 words. A 1% match, therefore, will be 15 words long and exactly as long as this sentence, which is not an insignificant chunk of text, so we can't simply exclude small matches like we did earlier. OK, that done. Remembering the lessons learned from our second essay, let's check the bibliography. Well, it's nice to see that there is one. And knowing that there is one will prove helpful to us as we go through the report. As we find sources, we can check that they are included in the bibliography. However, again, the bibliography has been highlighted as a match by the similarity report and is accounting for some of the similarity score. So let's use the filter again to exclude the bibliography. And that doesn't seem to have worked. There's no real knowing why sometimes Turnitin works and sometimes it doesn't. It's just how Turnitin is and there's nothing we can do about it. All we can do is move on to the third stage of our workflow, working down the essay, looking at each highlighted match in turn. There are, of course, other ways you can do this. You could use the match overview and work your way down through that list. The downside of this, though, is that you'll be looking through the essay in a non-sequential manner, which you might find odd. You'll also find that you'll often be having to click through 
a number of separate matches that you could easily handle in one go, like this bibliography. Looking at the first match, this is a straightforward match to a random text generator, so we can ignore this one. The second match, though, is a significant chunk of text, and clicking on the source, we can see that it comes from an academic journal from Shunting et al. Now, the text does have quotation marks around it, but there's no citation. If we look at the bibliography, we can see that the shunting source is listed here, so there certainly doesn't appear to be any attempt here to deceive, no attempt to take credit for shunting's work. The only real issue is that the citation is missing. And here we come to the fourth stage of our workflow, providing clear feedback for problematic areas. The best way to do this is to provide feedback on the script itself, so that it's clear to students what we're referring to. If I select the passage by clicking and dragging, you'll see three icons appear. The first brings up your Quickmark comments. The second enables you to provide a custom comment. I'll click on the custom comment and write some notes for the student. The next step in the workflow is to save reusable comments as quick marks for future use. It might be that this comment is something that I will end up having to use on other essays, or maybe even again in this essay. So I'm going to use this link here to convert the comment into a quick mark. I'll give it a name so that I can easily remember. And this will save the comment. And if I ever come across something similar again, I can simply click on the quick marks and select the comment to insert it again. Now, this next match appears to lack both quotation marks and a citation. Now, this could be a problem. If I open the source, I can see that the text comes from a paper by Winston and Bowd. Now, looking back at the essay, there is actually a citation for Winston and Bowd at the end of the paragraph. The source also appears in the bibliography. Again, there is clearly no attempt to deceive here. It's just that the student has forgotten or didn't realise that they need to put quotation marks around the text that comes directly from the source. So again, I can add some guidance for the student. I'll save the quick mark. Now we can move past these next couple of random text matches until we come to this one. This is a block quote. There is a citation, which is good, and the source appears in the bibliography. There are no quotation marks again, but a block quote does not necessarily need one. We know it's a block quote because it's been indented. The indent is, in a sense, the equivalent of quotation marks. So there's no real problem with this match. The source is properly indicated and attributed. This next match has a problem that we've already seen. There is a citation, but there's no quotation marks. So I can make use of the quick mark I saved earlier. Select the text, choose the quick mark icon, and search for my quick mark on missing quotation marks. This match is interesting though, because there are three different colour codes. It, it seems odd that the match itself and the citation should be seen as coming from different sources. However, a short investigation will explain what's going on here. If I click on the source for the main match, we're taken to a blog page. I can search on the page for the matching text, and here we can see the quote itself. Now, technically, this means that the student should be referring to the source as a secondary source. But again, the multiple colour codes makes me suspicious, so I'm going to click on the source in the match overview to get more information about it. Here I can see that Turnitin has actually matched this bit of text to five different sources. And the second of these is Stoker Walker and Van Nuren's original paper. Now, it is perfectly possible that the student used the original text, 
The problem is, if we look at the bibliography, this particular source isn't referenced. So we don't know whether the student has read the blog page or the original essay. So I need to tell my student about this as well. If I click on my quick mark and scroll to the bottom, there's a space here where I can add additional information to the comment. And we're done. We have one more significant match to look at. This one actually looks quite good. I see the citations are there, which is great, but there are no quotation marks. If I click on the source itself, I see, ah, ah, now here is a problem. For a moment there, I, I didn't think it was an issue because there were citations. However, the source tells me that the citations have just been copied from the source itself. This, this paper by David and Goff. Looking at the bibliography, there is no David and Goff represented. What we have here then is a significant chunk of text that contains no evident attempt to show that it is not the student's own work, and that is a problem. OK, so we've gone through all the matches. I guess we're done. No, well, not yet. We have one final step in our workflow. Check the essay for images, tonal shifts or unmatched references. As we've already demonstrated, Turnitin is fallible. It goes wrong. But it also fails to pick up on something. For example, this image here. Turnitin cannot match images, so there's no way of knowing whether this chart is the student's own work or if it's come from another source. This second image, though, does contain a citation for Perovich and Young. And scrolling to the bibliography, I can see that Perovich and Young appear here. So it's clear where the images come from. Really, I need to add a comment reminding the student that they need to provide a citation for all their images. Except I, I can't click and drag to select because there's no text here to select. I mean, I could just add a comment randomly on the page. But for the sake of clarity, this time I'm going to write my comment directly next to the image. If I click on the white page, you can see that I now have this text icon on the right. Clicking this, I can add my comments directly on the page itself. Now, it's worth noting, you shouldn't really overuse this direct text approach because often students will want to print out their feedback. And for some reason, the formatting of these text comments does tend to go a bit haywire when you try to print them. However, in places where there's plenty of space for the text to go, it can be a good way to make sure that your comment is seen and is in the place where it should be. There is another oddity in this essay, though, and it appears here, where the style of writing changes dramatically compared to the rest of the text. There are some odd word choices here as well, the use of professors instead of academics or researchers. It almost seems like a synonym has been used. Further, there are a couple of references here to we introduce and our research. Who is we and what research? I mean, Turnitin's not picked up anything, but it's suspicious enough to warrant a quick Google search. We can see that the package details an MCQ format called ROC. So let's search for and right at the top, we can see this abstract for this paper. It's pretty evident from this that the student has paraphrased this abstract without any attempt to attribute the original authors. This makes it a problem. So that's it. We've explored the similarity report interface. We've looked at a huge variety of things the similarity report might produce and looked at ways to deal with each one. And we've gone through a workflow that you can use to go through similarity reports quickly and efficiently.